Have you ever wondered how inconvenience can make your life better? That's what we'll talk about today. Excellence is inconveniently difficult. The opposite of inconvenience is innovation. Where you don't innovate, there will be inconveniences. Where there is inconvenience shall be innovation. Jaina Chakoli. Today we're going to frame our conversation around the book, The Comfort Crisis by Michael Easter. He talks about how there's been new study that we are at our best when we're physically tougher, mentally tougher. We have a spiritual life that's enriching us, that somehow all the discomforts we're trying to avoid in our life is making us weaker, sicker, psychologically unwell, and providing a lack of meaning in our lives. He says, in the end, we get a lot of benefit from discomfort talks about even, you know, obvious things. Like if you quit drinking, it's uncomfortable. If you decide to lose weight and get stronger, uncomfortable. If you go out and take a new job, let me assure you, uncomfortable. But those things make our lives better. And if we don't have any of the physical problems we used to have, like not being able to find food, not being able to get out of the cold, it ends up making us feel, it makes us feel safe, but in a fake way. And then it causes us to make risky decisions because we think everything is safe around us. It doesn't get us out into the world. We spend less time with people and less times challenging ourselves for other things. He said that He said that Americans now spend about 93% of our time in climate-controlled areas and that most of the cities like Las Vegas and Phoenix wouldn't even exist if we didn't have climate control. I saw this map of where the dead center of population was in the United States. And until like 1950, it was mostly north because it was cooler and the temperatures were more reasonable. As soon as air conditioning was invented, the whole line went south. Let's get our sunshine and get the air conditioning. And it is because of that comfort that allows us to do other things. But he says that he also thinks it's making us unhealthy. It's bringing our lifespan down. And so he said, quote, yes, we don't have to deal with discomforts like working for our food, moving hard and heavy each day, feeling deep hunger or being exposed to the elements. But what we do have to deal with are the side effects of our comfort, long-term physical and mental problems. We lack physical struggles, like having to work for our livelihoods. And we have too many ways to numb out, like comfort food and cigarettes. Everything in our life is about us not paying attention. My friend even wondered about me, because I'm always on my phone, and I'm always doing something. If I'm mowing the lawn, if I'm doing something around the house, I am 100% of the time, from the moment I get up to the moment I go to bed, listening to books, listening to podcasts, because I have to, I have to get material for my own podcast. But there is never a moment where I have turned everything off, where I have a moment's quiet. I am always reading or listening to podcasts or doing podcasts. It is a constant part. And she wonders, how am I ever really thinking about things? How am I ever getting through solutions? And I didn't think it was a problem, like I said, until I took a drive home to visit my mom and my brother. And suddenly, I had this four-hour drive in front of me. And you know what? I decided on a job. I decided to buy tires. I decided to create a plan for half a dozen different things. That four-hour trip allowed me the time to think some things out that I hadn't been spending any time thinking about. It suddenly struck me she was right. I was never having off time to think about problems. Instead, I was just shifting them around and pushing them off because I just didn't have time to think about them. He says that we have problem creep, which means we have fewer problems 
but we don't get more satisfied. That's where I was talking about that window where we evaluate our life, we think about what sorts of problems we may have, and then we judge our inconvenience in our life based on how many of those problems we have. And that, he says, makes our problems more hollow because people were wondering about their fundamental existence before, and now we're wondering if the Wi-Fi is going to be okay on our airplane. He says that Lavari called it comfort creep. Quote, when a new comfort is introduced, we adapt to it, and our old comforts become unacceptable. Today's comfort is tomorrow's discomfort, and this leads to new levels of what is considered comfortable. So, for example, when I started getting on the internet, it was a dial-up modem, it stunk, it took forever to get on, and just as you were getting something done online, your roommate, your family would say, hey, could you hang up the modem so I can call my friend? But I'm on the internet. Inconvenience. <laughs> when you think of how slow, how terrible, how much the internet lacked information, and now we're wondering if the Wi-Fi on our airplane is going to be good enough. That creep of what is important and what's comfortable becomes different and becomes much more minor. And so then we get annoyed when we can't download our podcast in the airport or we're driving in the middle of the woods and suddenly the Google map stops working. We're annoyed at that. And what kind of toll is that taking on us spiritually, emotionally, when the smallest thing starts to upset us? And just to give you the irony of the whole situation, you know what I just did? It's kind of an hour from bedtime. I went into my room and I have a little room air conditioner because it got really warm in my room. So I turn on the air conditioner so it could be cooler before I go to bed. Having a personal air conditioner in just one room, such a convenience. It's not something I had when I was growing up. I was warm all the time. But you can see how every need and issue we're having is met. I don't disparage that. I like the fact I can sleep when I'm cool. But you can see, you know, I'm never going to learn to adapt to the warmth because I have this little air conditioner with me all the time. I'm never going to learn to be a better writer because I have Grammarly fixing my writing for me. So in a sense, because I lack that struggle anymore, I also lack progression in my own life. He talks about this practice of misogi and any type of cleansing that you have. They mention it in the same terms of hydrotherapy baptism, the mikvah bath, you know, there's all sorts of cultures that have this kind of a practice. And he decided to go through something like that, something of a spiritual challenge to add a cleansing to his life, to get away from fear and anxiety so that he can start focusing on something that matters. He said that in his model of misogi, there's only two rules. One of them is that it has to be hard. And number two is you can't die. So they have some practices that they go to, a 10K run, something that is truly difficult to do. And he said that when you test yourself, when you put yourself through a challenge, it makes you better as long as, again, it doesn't kill you. But all sorts of cultures do a walkabout, the aboriginal people, they do a challenge, they do something they have to do to essentially enter adulthood. And so he says in his case, he is trying to reach a f challenge so he can gain that emotional, spiritual, psychological growth. And he felt that this challenge, this inconvenience, and this struggle was going to make him better in a lot of ways. There's no comparison. This isn't a race. You're supposed to go through a hard thing for you. If running a 10K is not hard for you, that's not the right challenge, but it's an intentional hardship that you're giving yourself so that you can be better. He says if you go through a hardship, don't boast about it. Don't tell other people. This is something private. This is meant to be something meaningful to you. Don't blab about it on social media. This is supposed to be something that is a growth for you. You're not looking for a pat on the back. You're not looking for someone to say, good job and like your post. You are doing this hard thing for the purposes of doing it. 
He says overall that people who face adversity tend to do better. They have higher satisfaction in life. Isn't that interesting? That if you face adversity, you are physically healthier, psychologically healthier, and happier. You think of people who have hardships as not being as happy. I even think about it when I was growing up. It was difficult for me. I was bullied. I couldn't find my way. I didn't feel like I had people I could talk to other than my friends, but I didn't have any sort of adults in my life that were helping me. And yet, if you asked me if I had a happy childhood, I would tell you I did. I felt happy, but I knew who I was, even in the face of the adversity that I felt. It wasn't a good thing. I knew it wasn't a good thing, but I learned peace, and I learned to have peace in high-stress situations, parents yelling at each other, drunkenness, embarrassment. I mean, you name it as things that you face as a kid. I was able to find a, a settlement about it, a peace about it, and learn to be happy in it. And so I think that's part of what he's getting to, is being happy, peaceful, content. It's not about the situation you're in. We tend to think of it that way right now. Oh, well, I have a job I love. I'm content. Or I'm doing the thing I love doing. I'm content. Or I'm on vacation right now. I'm very happy. Those types of of feelings and emotions happen because of who you are, not because of what you're doing. And you learn that. Unfortunately, the best way is in an unhappy situations that you can find happiness in discomfort. You can find success in disasters. In England, they found out that a lot of people are on autopilot sort of sleepwalk. We've done that in driving where you wake up and it's suddenly, you know, 100 miles down the road and you wondered what happened. We're not engaged in our lives. And I think that's, in a sense, what adversity or inconvenience does for us. It brings us back, you know. And so all the things that we have when we have a life of convenience is being petty, worrying about what other people have, what they're thinking. And so I think a lot of what I see from people being unhappy or this whole social media crisis has a lot to do with the fact we have too much time on our hands, that we look at other people too much, that we don't take things seriously that really matter, but instead we're trying to sort of judge everything based on an artificial way of looking at people. That person didn't even look at me this morning when I walked in the building. Boy, you used to live in times in war, of World War II, where if you lived that day to the end, you were grateful. And now we're wondering why that person at the front door didn't even look at us when we walked in. It is becoming too convenient. I think it's making us unhappy and maybe even a little bit weird. He talked about this practice in Japan where people are living in a single room house. They never leave their bedrooms. They never see anybody. Years inside of isolation. They don't get married. They don't date. They don't have family relationships. They just live in this one space for the rest of their lives. And the question is, why is that? What mental health issue is causing people to not even want to go out? Part of the consideration has to do with the city that as cities become more dense, people feel more and more alienated. I know for me that when I was in Los Angeles, I was at first very excited. I walked down Rodeo Drive. I spent my time at the tar pits. I would go to the Beverly Mall, which is this high-end mall in Beverly Hills, and just walk around. All I did was walk around after work all day long until sunset. But after a while, Los Angeles just became kind of a drag. You couldn't go anywhere. It took me two hours to go 15 miles to the Santa Monica Pier. I even did a crazy thing. I brought my bike helmet and I rented a bike and biked to the Santa Monica Pier. It was really dangerous, but at least I got there in a reasonable amount of time. And being in a city just makes me think, life is so inconvenient, I don't even feel like doing things anymore because it's too long to get anywhere. Los Angeles made me feel isolated. I couldn't wait to get home where I could actually be outside and be with people. And driving to work took 10 minutes. 
So he encourages us to get out there, have lunch, go to a coffee shop, join a club, be on a softball team, do something that will make our lives better and get us out of the solitude, away from the loneliness, make ourselves more available to other people. It will enrich our own lives and it will enrich the lives of other people. He gives this example that there's two types of people in, in this story who pick berries. There's one worker who picks berries the quickest. And he goes to many different bushes. He has lots of different experiences. And he's trying to figure out ways to be better at it. The other person's bored. They hate the job. And they barely do a minimal amount at the job. Now, you may say that this is bad for the employer of these two people picking berries. But it's bad for the employee, too. The board employee isn't making any headway, isn't using any creativity, isn't inventing new things or new ideas, while the engaged employee, even though they're just picking berries, is thinking and enjoying and figuring things out. His life is a lot happier. And so just being more engaged, just doing something that is more interesting, more exciting, makes life better. He's Throughout the book, using this discussion of a hike or a trip he takes with a friend, I could have looked at my hike that I took with my friend as just one foot in front of the other, and it's just drudgery. It's trucking along, another tree, another this. But instead, it is new things coming at us all the time. It's a new look and a new building and a new thing. And you could look at life as a rat race or you can look at it as full of challenges and exciting things. You can look at picking berries as stupid, or you can look at it being exciting. And he talks about how scientists at Oregon State University found daily stressors improves our resistance. Makes me think of like viruses, right? When you get exposed to a virus, it makes your body stronger because you fight off the virus and then you're stronger for it. You're healthier for it because you overcame something. Again, as long as it doesn't kill you. If we never have that virus of life, we become weaker. We become less strong. We never have challenges. And those daily stresses could help us with brain disease, could help us with anxiety and loneliness. But instead, when we avoid them, we eventually become less people. We become lesser individuals. Makes me think of this commercial I saw back in the 90s where these family was driving to Mount Rushmore and their kids were in the back watching TV while you were driving by Mount Rushmore and these Grand Canyons and all these events because this van had TV in it and you didn't have to worry about your kids yelling all the time. Oh my gosh, if I took my kids out to the Grand Canyon and they watched TV while we were driving by it, I would probably take a sledgehammer to the TV and they would be out of the car in moments. We just zone out and we zone out our kids and we keep them unengaged in life. And so then they don't have those great experiences. We can protect ourselves and don't have those great experiences. And he says even something small like a, lo a walk through a park can do magic for us. But if we remove all the inconveniences, we move all the stresses away from us, we're going to end up less happy and lonely. So my challenge to you is think about an inconvenience that made your life better. Now that you look back at it, now that you think about it, is there a way that those inconveniences made something better? And is there a way that you could slowly reintroduce an inconvenience into your life that will challenge you, give you that virus of life that will make you grow? make you stronger, and make you want to take on bigger challenges. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to tell a friend about this podcast. I'm trying to grow the podcast so we're a bigger community. I'd love to hear from you. You can always email me at startwithsmallsteps.com. And remember, overcoming and enjoying the inconveniences of life starts with small steps.